The generation of 1950, as it is known now, is our generation. We were born in the late 20s and beginning of the 30s, and we all began to have our books published around uh, this magical uh, date of the 1950. This is why we are known by the generation of the 50s or the mid-century generation. Our first books all were published since that moment on. Myself, I published uh, this little booklet in 1950 or 51, and in 1952 I got a uh, access it to the Adonai's Prize, and I published in 1953 my first book, Desde esta orilla, and I got in 1953 my second prize, City of Barcelona, and I published my second book uh, with the prize, uh, Poemas del Viajero, in 1954. From that moment, uh, our generation was established. In the generation, I would say that roughly we could have two nuclei in, in Madrid and Barcelona. I was one of the poets of the Barcelona uh, connection, and we were people writing in uh, Castilian in our hometown in Barcelona, where we had been educated in the general language of Spain. We used Catalan, and we, are, we were, you know, uh, good Catalan uh, soldiers, I would say, from our home region. But at the same time, our education had been in Spanish, and we tried to give glory to Catalonia in Spanish. The general tone of the Spain in the 40s, 50s, 60s was a tone of censorship for poetry, censorship for the writers that were the only free agents in a society that was really always under political uh, control. This is why always dictatorships have been unhappy about writers, because writers are essentially the people that are going to say the truth whatever it comes. Uh, three years, three long years of civil war had brought Spain to a kind of prostration. And uh, later on, when we began with university life, we were in a country at the moment in which there was a big war in Europe that was very isolated. The result of the Spanish Civil War, the long uh, post-war period, coupled with the uh, Second World War, made Spain a very isolated and isolationist country, in a way. We were not able to get very many books printed out of Spain. We were not able almost to go out of them. For us to have a passport and to go out of the frontier was a tremendous and exciting adventure. Everything related to travel and to this is why perhaps my, my book, my second book, is called precisely Poemas del Viajero, the poems of the traveler. Uh, there was a myth about traveling, about being outside. The world was wonderful and waiting for us, and it was a pity to be inside Spain. In a way, sometimes it was like being in a prison. Certainly, America was something uh, which was the most interesting thing you could get at that moment. Uh, everything new was going there. We didn't know anything for sure. There was not even relations, diplomatic relations between Spain and America. Uh, in 1952-53, when I was in Madrid, uh, for the first time there was a relationship with uh, the United States, and then uh, suddenly there were these possibilities of uh, coming to America. One of them, for me, was the invitation of Harvard University. Discovery of America to Enrique de Rivas. Before the Mayflower reached Cape Cod, 
before Balboa, before Diego de Velázquez, much, much before the, then when Juan Ponce de Leon discovered Florida, before John Cabot, before the day in which Alexander VI, in his wisdom, decided part of your future, much before than 1507, in which Walzer Müller baptized you with the name of the Italian Americo Vespucci, because he drove your form with words that he borrowed. Before the moment in which the banner of my country gave form to your body, before even before than the dreams of Christopher Columbus, before Torfir Karlsefni with three ships from 1003 to 1006 could not do what later, later on Spain did, before the saga of Eric Duret, before Leif Erikson looked for you, before the more ancient words that one day looked for you, Variant anni secula series, quibus oceanus, vincula rerum laxet, et ingens patiat terus, that is quenovos, that egat orbes, nec sit terris ultima tule. Much, much before all this, I can discover you this morning. And then in the 60s, I was, uh, I decided to come to America. A first trip in 1955 uh, brought me to Harvard, where I attended an international summer seminar. My friends there were poets. The American poet uh, Richard Wilbur was the chairman of our uh, meetings in poetry. There were poets of all over the world, uh, from India, Sachi Raud Roy, uh, for Italy, from Italy, uh, Maria Luisa Spaziani, from England, John Heath Stubbs. Uh, this was a first opening to America for me. At that moment, after Harvard, I gave a few lectures in the United States, in certain universities. I went back to Spain, but the call of America was very strong. I knew here, you know, I could do another part of my life, you know, that I wanted here in your country. And then I decided in 1960 to come first to Colgate University and uh, then to Syracuse University, Colgate 1960, Syracuse 1962. Then in a way, now, uh, since I came to America when I was 32, and I have spent 32 years of my life in America, I could say that half of my life was in Spain and half of my life has been here. The first definition of a university in our culture in Spain is the definition of a King Alphonse X, who we call the wise. Alphonse X, one of our greatest and wisest kings, said that the university is ayuntamiento de maestros e discípulos, the joining together of masters and disciples, professors and students, we would say today. <laughs> Even very fortunate I was when I got to the university in Barcelona and I found so many friends that were all of them looking for a future in literature, in poetry. All of us, we helped each other. We were in a kind of autodidacticism that needed the others. I have mentioned before the important role of my friend Alfonso Costafreda over us because he was a little older. And my own age, like uh, the poet Carlos Barral, the poet Alberto Liar, that later on, do you know, went on to legal and political uh, careers, but he was a poet also of our group, or uh, Jose Agustin Goitisolo, next to his brother uh, Juan and Luis, who were novelists. All of us, we were a kind of people that were helping each other to cope with 
a, uh, an ambience where it was difficult to get a real education. And this was our great victory, I think. And later on, same thing in Madrid. I was connected with, I think, the best people of my, of my generation. And this was a constant education for me. The education is what you get from yourself, what you set to get and your friends help you. This is why I always try to instill on my students, apart from your formal education, there is another greater education that you can get in these years that life gives you and that are free of uh, worry. We learn from each other. I learn. I learned a lot from you. I am learning now from your questions from your interest, from what you want to know. And I never cease to learn from you. I am very grateful that I could spend my life in a university environment. I was always interested in university activities in my youth when I was your age, and I continue to be. And I think this is something that maintains you young. I think that what you learn is only a little bit of what is going on that this is what you have to give to the others. And what the others give to you is the greatest part of your education. And this doesn't cease at all. It goes on forever. And the next to the last poem, which I read before, is a poem that for me has a special meaning, perhaps, because it's a kind of goodbye to my students at Syracuse. I am naming in this poem some of my Puerto Rican and New Rican students in one of my literature courses. And as you see, I am repeating her names. Adriana, Alejandra, Lizelle, Lourdes, Isa, Yvette, Yvonne. Elda, Tatiana, Taina. Vuelven vuestros nombres y vuestras sonrisas que alegran la clase hoy que está vacía. ¿Cuánto me enseñasteis que yo no sabía? Recordando el barrio, añorando la isla. Aprendí en vosotras gracia en la injusticia y fidelidad en la lejanía. No olvidaré la lección aprendida, Adriana, Alejandra, Lizel, Lourdes, Isa. Quiere a Mab, a Titania, a Broselianda, a las sobrenaturales y avasalladoras del Dark. Como una historia inventada por ella para que él no sufra por su muerte, Existe, por supuesto, evidencia textual para apoyar esta interpretación. Unos momentos antes, Octavia le ha dicho, ¿qué no haría yo para que no me llorase, mi pobre Piqué? Y su exhortación a que se vuelva a enamorar después de que triunfe puede verse como expresión de una generosidad extremada. Sin embargo, hay otras pistas textuales que nos pueden llevar a pensar que su confesión es verdadera. Y voy a referir to... Uh, master, the master of my generation in Spain was certainly the poet Vicente Alexandre. I met him in 1948 when I was 20 years old, and from that moment on, he was a constant influence in my poetry. My first a uh, little booklet was called La Piedra Más Reciente with a line from him. El cabello ondea como la piedra más reciente. And Vicente, from that moment on, went to be one of the great influence, I would say, not only in my poetry, but in the poetry of my generation. At the same time, I met Vicente through a friend, a little older, two years older than me, born in uh, a town next to mine, 
uh, in the town of Tarrega, next to my town of Cervera. And uh, this poet, Alfonso Costafreda, was a definite influence also in my work. Uh, I met him when I was uh, 20, also 19 or 20. He introduced us to Vicente Alexandre, by the way. And he, coming from Madrid, where he had known Alexandre, Bolsonaro, and other poets, uh, you know, was a mature poet with a book that was going very soon to be uh, uh, published and getting a big prize in Barcelona. I would say that my friend Alfonso was an influence in my poetry. Influence is a problem, I would say, of tone. You are adapted to a certain tone. This is why, among my influences, I went to music as the first one. Because I think the interest in music is something that uh, it's important for any poet. It's also pound, the one that has given as a definition of poetry, uh, the one of words set to music, and that has said repeatedly that uh, a poet should be acquainted with musicians. The same pound as I remember when I asked about him in Venice, where uh, he died after many years of a long uh, love affair with the city, uh, was remembered not as much as the poet, but as uh, il musicista, the musician, as the Italian said. At the same time, in the next category of influence, direct influence in my poetry, I selected Vicente Alexandre. I think Vicente was a ton of rebellion amongst the poets of his generation. And the one that, you know, reached more quickly in the younger poets as we were there. And this is exactly also the kind of influence that Alfonso Costafreda had in my poetry. A poetry of non-acceptance uh, conformity, of looking for something else. And it's also what I found in Pound. Then perhaps this is one of the things I was looking in my poetry. And this is why uh, my poetry has been a little out of the current at certain occasions. This book is really inspired by the movement of the theology of liberation, specifically in Nicaragua, where the uh, father Ernesto Cardenal, who later on was to be a uh, minister of culture in the Sandinista government, uh, started an experience of bringing the gospel to the poor fishermen and peasants of the archipelago the island of Solentiname in Lake Nicaragua. Uh, I feel that in the central metaphor of the roots of a new kind of Christianity, there is one of the ways in which the future of America will be accomplished. The wings of the phoenix as is the title of the book, because it's so uh, title. The wings of the phoenix for me are the Chicanos and the New Ricans in the United States. Either the Mexican Americans or Chicanos in the West, or the New Ricans, it is to say the Puerto Ricans born in the mainland and living in the mainland America, in your country, in the United States. In both of them, I see two of the wings of the spirit of the Spanish uh, way of life. I think they are going to bring to you and to the world the best of our language, our culture, and our way of life understanding of what is life for us. This is why the last poems that I read 
are dedicated to the Chicanos and to the Neorriqueños. And the last poem is dedicated to uh, my friend Josep Breu. Y el último poema del libro dedicado a mi amigo el sacerdote y en cierto modo teólogo de la liberación, aunque no estuviera alineado en sus filas, Josep Breu. Regreso a Colombia para imaginarme en tu Medellín tu vida incansable junto a los más pobres, a los que dejaste cuanto fuera tuyo. Pienso hoy que una parte de tu historia es mía, mas la mejor parte se quedó con ellos. No la sabe nadie. Quiero que esta crónica acabe en el aire, donde, cuando el hombre muere, nace el ángel.